one way of creating games that are remembered and well known for a really long time is by creating a very unique art direction. Those art directions are usually known as stylized art directions. Right here and right now, we're going to take a look at the production pipeline to stylized art directions by Panayotis Tiapkolis. Please, a round of applause. Hello, yeah. So hi everyone, thank you for coming. So I'm Panayotis, also known as Panthavma Online. And I've been uh, working with, uh, on game development for quite a while. Actually, I think that's 13 years now. Uh, some of it even paid, uh, paid, which was a big mistake. But the, and uh, from the very, very beginning, I wanted to do stylized rendering, stylized things, different art styles. And which led to me, which I am actually now a PhD student in stylized rendering. Although today I'm coming to you as a six years Godot user, doing this for fun on, uh, well, how to do, make own games like this. So, in this talk, what I will talk about is what the obstacles that, that you will find when doing this for styles rendering, what are the obstacles for production, how to plan for them during your production project, and how to solve some of them, and how I put it in practice with an actual example in Godot 3. What this talk is not about, however, is not how to make a specific style, because as we can see, we'll get quite technical if you do that, and it's already the end of the day, so let's not go that deep into it. So, what is stylized rendering, which is also known as NPR, as you may see, non photorealistic rendering, or expressive rendering if you're reading papers. So, it's a, it's a lot of things, but two of the main things that interest us here are its ability to st uh, do styles, which go from stylized PBR photorealistic re rendering, uh, can do anime, or even some very esoteric styles, like this one bit uh, render from uh, Return of the Oberdin. But it's also very good for clarity, which has made, which has, made it so that it's been used in softwares like FreeCAD or, and in some games even to really make the appearance clear. So let's see what one of the, something that's really good to understand, to s understand some of the difficulties is to compare photos versus drawings. A photo, like you can put the camera, the objects, the lights, how you want, and then take the photo, and it's very artistic, and you have the, uh, but all the rendering is done by the laws of physics. Like here, it's a photo of my home city, Bordeaux, and it has the, you can see the reflection of the water mirror. And it's very, uh, very cool. But when you do drawings, you also use the laws of physics, but as guidelines instead. So for instance, here on this image from uh, your Ugandan narrative, like the light on, the, on Jonah's face is not coherent with the light on his helmet. And there's even some lights that are ignored. So you, you can actually change that locally. So the problem then is that rendering actually works like photos. You, you program in the rules and then you have the results. So how can we bridge that? Well, we, uh, when you look at what artists actually do, for instance, we, in this study from Cole and colleagues in 2008, uh, they tried to see where artists will actually draw lines and they managed to see artists tend to draw lines at around the same place, but not all the time. But they are correlated to geometric uh, properties. That means we can actually create, uh, find those some of these lines. But do we display them or not? That's not uh, that's not something you can put with simple rules. There's some global info. There's some semantics. So you need to give artists a way to control that in a paradigm that doesn't really work. That's still an open problem. That's and therefore you also have an additional one. Whenever you start moving, like it's really easy to make something that looks all right from a single perspective, but as soon as you move, that doesn't work anymore. So this is, a, this is a problem that is already present in a lot of, uh, lot of things. We have three main properties we usually tend to optimize for during those, which are flatness, that the image looks 2D, motion coherence, so that the style goes with the image, and temporal coherence, so that it doesn't flicker. So some styles have it easier, like I said, like anime, which have the same problem on the paper. So instead of this stuff, like use celluloids and paint with gouache onto them in two-tone shading, because the gouache, when it dries down, the gravity will uh, flatten it out and you will remove the brush strokes, so therefore you can animate it better. So let's try to see why simple solutions are not enough. If I put the, if I put the noise in the, the camera, you get what's called the shower door effect. Let me show you with high technology what it looks like. But then if you put the stylization on the object, you have what the opposite end, the wallpaper effect, where you don't have flatness anymore. 
as you can see. It just looks painted out with, because it is. And so we have to go to more complex solutions. So now I get into the next part and I'll tell you some of the five problems you definitely encounter every time in the, your productions. No, just kidding. Eh? It's just a general thought framework. It's not complete. It's my experience by talking with people, seeing my own production, seeing production uh, projects. And it's, but I think it's good to get you started. So the first problem you're going to encounter is technology. Because uh, it's, uh, you might think, oh, it's stylized, you know, it's simple. So, but actually, no, it can be just as technical as PBR, just in some different ways. And it can be really hard to implement it to the pipelines because of some assumptions made earlier. Just to give you an idea, because it sounds scary, like this is one of the acceleration structures if you want to draw lines on the screen. And you have to use the mesh graph to do a dual space mesh and reproject it. And this is a simple version, actually. The real one is a four-dimensional projection with hyperplane to segment collisions. Because we actually know to compute that better. But let's give an example. So you have to know your team to choose the solutions that are actually achievable in your time frame. And to give a bit more example, like for airline rendering, which by the way, you can see I have the little uh, extra slides here and links. That's for the end of the talk if you want to know more about that. So online rendering, you have three main methods. You have the inverted hull, everybody knows it, uh, which takes 30 seconds in Blender to, to do, uh, like for real. But he has some artifacts you can see on the neck. You could try it in screen space, which, may, which works is the fastest method, but it's hard to control all of the time. And it's also harder. You need a tech artist or even three programmer if you want a more advanced version. And you have mesh contours, which are not ready for real time at the moment. And uh, that can do some really advanced renders. Like you can see this one is just lines, this one too. But this one is very complex and very hard to implement. Then you have the tools themselves, because the tools are, as we can see, control is hard. And a lot of tools are focused on PBR, so they have all this, uh, this standardized pipeline. So, and specific controls can be an open problem. For instance, what happens for things that change depending on the perspective, the viewpoint? So that means you often need custom work. This is an example, for instance, with uh, shading. Instead of using the regular tune shading, which is on the bottom left, or the, some of the normal smoothest version on the bottom, you could actually control that in uh, this example by keyframing it to the right. Uh, and we'll come back to that a bit later. Then you have the knowledge barrier. Because, you, because the knowledge can be very sparse and it's not super known, but also there's a lot of different perspectives. There's artists, there's tech artists, and there's programmers. And the scientific world with the artistic world have been very separated. And because you have so little resources, when you have a reference, it can really much overshadow the others. For instance, the Motomura's talk in 2015 about the pipelines for Guilty Geek Third has been an industry standard, thanks to that. But yeah, and uh, that means that's also been used verbatim by a lot of projects and not iterated upon. And but that's also hard because the research can be really hard to read and implement. What I would suggest here is to read from different sources, for instance, blogs, both from artists and programmers. Then you have your project organization, because you need the right people at the right time, of course, which can be like an art director or someone that also knows about those rendering techniques. And I think the, pre the critical time is pre-production. That's when you want to iterate on your art style. Uh, you need to go fast, so to have someone who already knows what they're doing. And you also need to create the tools that we use for the rest of the game. So for that, you have to schedule it in your side your project, either with your team or even an external collaborator. And finally, you have production. So it's two risks, actually. One of them is that the time can be longer than expected because you have no experience or standard on those. You have to train your artists again. But at the same time, you could also use those techniques to go faster. Or in marketing, you can having a very distinct style can really repulse people. But at the same time, it also makes you really stand out and be unique. But so yeah, I've talked a lot about uh, you know stuff. So now let's uh, you want actually to see cool images probably. So let's see uh, what I'm actually doing. So it's so I'm not an artist, it's uh, an old screenshot, plus I wasn't feeling well that day, you know all of that. Uh, but yeah, so I have my, uh, my own game as a 2D fighter. Often. So I will be detailing how the pipeline works and also sprinkling some of my watercolor shader. So first of all, you're going to have to define your objectives for that. So who is in your team that where you can actually uh, apply the pipeline to them? For me, it's me, which, uh, who is technical, who actually knows how that works, but can't really do a lot of art. 
what is the priority in the game where I must separate the front and back because it goes very fast, it needs to be readable, and it works in uh, several lighting conditions, all of that. So these are constraints you have to keep in mind when doing the art style, and then you have a production priorities. And for me, the art is the bottleneck, so I need to leverage the power of rendering. So to give a quick idea of how I went to it, so I had my first renders here, which were in April, uh, which okay works, but I wanted to go further and actually implement the style I wanted to. And since the background didn't really work that well here with that style, I said, well, I have the watercolor shader laying out. What does that work in, uh, in any image software? Not that well, let's try it again. Well, a bit better, but you know, it could change. So I decided to go with a more a painting impressionist art style. So this was the first, first iteration. Then I actually started to do a bit more with it. I put back the mech shader. Then I actually also experimented with effects and finally did some adjustments. That's what it looks like, what it does look like now. Then I also implemented a bit with more of the, more shaders, more, more of the lines specifically around the mechs. I saw the line work was a bit too hard, so I made it a bit easier on the eyes. And then it right a bit. I'm about that level. I need to get a bit more into the mechs and the more designs to go a bit further than that because it's a bit more limited with just this example. But that's already good for now. Uh, but as you can see, it's been tricky. I needed to program all of that, so those algorithms, every time I wanted to do an implementation. So that's its um, problem. And at the same time, also iterating on the pilots themselves. So my resident direction here was to use heavy hierarchical lines, which is actually my drawing style uh, honed through years of doodling in class. Uh, I wanted to use a lot of smears in animation uh, in order to convey the sense of speed. And I wanted to have this uh, background become more and more abstract with, uh, in order to focus the attention on the foreground, kind of like what uh, Claude Monet does in his paintings. So then you have to choose how much you have to actually change your rendering. So you could change it a little, you know, put some, uh, sprinkle in some methods here and there, so it's easier, you stay integrated into the pipeline, but it's also more limited. On the other end, you could be a big boy and make your own custom renderer, but, I mean, that takes forever, you know, and you, have, you do have the most features, and it's the best quality of life when you actually made it, but it's very long, and you need some very specific skills. So that's actually a bit of an in-between method, call it hijacking, it's like when you trick the renderer into actually doing what you want, uh, but you have very little quality of life for that. You, you do live on the bleeding edge. So before going that, I will do a little side note about what you can do with the rendering. Like you could apply it for specific things, like to do some shading, so as we can see in with shading control, or to do some global adjustments, like reduce the contrast at a distance. You could also pre-compute or pre-render some parts. For instance, this is what I do here with the Game Boy Color rendering example I made, which was made in two hours, actually, the pipeline, and allows me to output sprites that look all right, for, especially for the time I spent on it. And that way you can accelerate your, your whole production, even if you use it as a base or as the result. So then, when you adject Godot 3, you actually need to be clever. It's not about the capacity of the renderer, but how you can twist it. So the limits were that all the light data is in the first place because of first forward renderer, and I can only have one output, but I can chain passes with that kind of structure. And, but they have a cost, uh, which is a, we can be an issue. So by the way, for Godot 4, well, Clay already talked about it, so, but he didn't invalidate my slide, so I'm glad for that. So you do have more features inside of PBR, which is very nice, but the general philosophy of the render being very easy to use doesn't really synergize, doesn't mean it doesn't work, but because the render aims to be easy to use while we actually want to rewrite the rules of reality in that, it kind of doesn't really work, you know, by itself. But there are a lot of discussion with relevant improvements well, on that you've seen the slide, but there are also like the rendering compositor, for instance. But yes, yeah, so when you adject Godot 3, you need to choose algorithms that work within those limits and choose the actual data because I have like 24 bits only to use. But you can link some of them through GDescript. But watch out, you don't have access to all of the effects, for instance, transparency of pro post processes, you have to redo. So my pipeline is pseudo deferred because I do use some of the same concepts, but I actually keep my light data here. So we can I actually do accumulate my uh, tune shading here in that aspect. I do my renders, then I composite them to have my frame. Then I have a line pass to find the to find the outlines, and then I combine them together. What's actually pretty cool is that I have my uh, I use Blender with Molt, which is an open source render, which gives me OpenGL access. So that means I have my render inside of Blender too. And if you look at it, it's the exact same. I even use about the same code. That's 
the people that I worked in a really big production know how much this is. And I actually export the chain data in the assets, which allows me to have direct use. Let me see that. Let me show you. So I pass some of my, I actually export some of my, um, instead of having color data in the buffer, I keep it in a material. And so I give an ID to my, uh, to my character using the UV. And then I actually store all my material data inside those 64 by 64 textures, which hold 256 materials each. And they are created automatically. So I just press export. And because Godot would read that in order to produce the render, that means that I have no extra step. I just press export, same render. So you have to choose the actual controls you have. So for Chrome and Titans, I do the color lighting under different conditions, atmospheric and uh, space. So I can control the color in very detailed way. The line color itself and the style, depending on how far you are from the camera. And the line separation for the really, uh, the really precise detail here. But every shader needs its own controls. Uh, for instance, for the watercolor, I was more on the pigment density and edge darkening. I had the deformation of every glaze group I have here. And the, I actually managed to also control which glaze and where they happen, depending on the colors and uh, depending on the shading and the actual material. You also, but you need to have this whole pipeline in mind. So when, even when you do your model, you need to take all the, the levels into account. So for instance, here my smears use the line rendering algorithm to merge the 3D models together and to give the impression of merging more likely by only drawing the line around them because it's an AD buffer. And the, my rig has a lot of automation because I know I'm on the static side, I might not be the best, but if it, once it moves, it looks better. So let's also automate a lot of that with the armor plates actually moving, the joint structure being respected. That's, that's why I made it for that. My animation emphasizes those. But yeah, but this end you have to adapt to your team, of course, because that works for me. If your team is more artistic, I found that having more control over that usually works well. Artists like to fiddle with things, even if it takes forever. So you want less control automation. But you also want some verifications because they, the, the, the errors can be hard to recover from. So you have to make the tools very high quality of life. But if, on the other end, you're like a programmer, doing programmer art I know, on your own. So what can you do? Well, in this case, you will want more automation of controls because as a programmer, you can actually write some of that, some of that logic, some of those heuristics. And therefore, you can make your rendering more shader driven, which gives you more leverage later to improve it all at once. And as a slight bonus before ending, so you can also use it elsewhere. For instance, uh, outside of the main render, for instance, in the menus, where here we have like Joker is a 3D model. And uh, uh, what you could also use for UI, I don't know if they do this, but for instance, because a person is like Pokemon and you have 500 demons, but you also have all those 3D models, you could use them with a shader to recreate the icons automatically and therefore get, the, get this uh, production speed up, which can also work for all your weapons and stuff like that. And so, to resume what we say, so you have to plan this uh, pipeline from the start to really put it into your production. You need to have some specific skill sets in your team or to hire them, even for a short period, for, to have that. You often will need custom tools, so you need to have that time both for creating them and for using them into your uh, own, uh, own, own project. But this can also be an opportunity to go faster and really make your game unique. So thank you for listening. I have this companion page, as, uh, as expected, uh, as I promised, where you can find the links I uh, gave. And I have some extra slides if you have more questions, some for parts of the, of the slide. So thank you. Uh, did I understand did you correctly that you said that you were going to sample 256 textures that you extract uh, that you exported from um, a blender to Godot? Uh, that's a long way around. I have 16 textures I can load dynamically and each one has 256 materials. That works well because like my robots is a fighting game. you have to change the palette so you just change the texture. but yeah it's a bit overkill but I had some room so it was okay. okay <laughs> thanks. So I saw that um, some of the lines are a bit um, like um, not very precise. So is there a way maybe in a shader to
do vector art out of that, out of the lines, so that it gets perfectly uh, straight? Uh, so that's actually, I mean, my lines were straight, and I decided to make them not straight, because that's how I know. But yeah, as you can see here, I don't know how much you can see, but the, okay, some of them are a bit weird, but here you can see they're actually very straight, and exactly where they need to be. This was actually more complicated to make like a more look uh, rougher than uh, this. The watercolor, yeah. So, um, so the like question was that um, he would like to know more about watercolor. Yeah, so this is a bit of a big topic because it can go very deep. And also I broke the shader a few weeks ago and I haven't got the chance to fix it to show you some buffers. Uh, but the idea is actually it works around the same things. It's based on a 2017 paper by Montes de Oca and colleagues, uh, which did a watercolor in real time. And some of the, which I have improved by talking to some artists and doing uh, additional stuff. So this runs inside of Godot at 120 FPS, real time. Uh, the idea here is that you have the glazes, the different glazes of watercolor that, are, uh, that can vary themselves a bit. And on the edges of the, of the zones, you have this pigment edge darkening because when the watercolor dries, it goes towards there, goes towards the edges. I use a lot of control, the same control I showed you earlier. And what I additionally do is also deform those glazes separately in order to composite them and to have color mixing. Like the gray on the halberd here is, uh, is actually yellow and blue because you don't really use grays in uh, watercolor. Um, there, there's also some things like there's, the, there's some details that are a bit hard to see. For instance, the paper here is a, and is a height map and is used for, the, for lighting computation of the external light that actually shines on top of the watercolor because it's transparent, it goes through, then back again. Uh, there could be something more with the pigment mixing. I didn't do it yet, but there were some papers even from 97 that did that. And uh, I also have uh, some uh, part where I can show it here because it's not video, but when you move, you do have this, uh, the shower door effect if you d just did that, but I tried to do some, uh, some dynamic redrawing of this. And the, with the same watercolor shader, you can do like those different styles here, which is like more saturated here. And, uh, the, but it's still the same shader, same ideas. Uh, it, is, it is a bit more involved, of course. Like it's, I think it's a thousand line or something, but it's uh, because there's a lot of small scale map. But, uh, but I recommend you read the, this uh, uh, paper by Montes de Oca if you want to learn more about it. Yeah, um, I was wondering, so in, in your case, is, is this is mostly like a programmer uh, approach or are you working with, with artists? Are you having to expose uh, control? So how, how do you, who, how would you approach if you need to give artists a lot of, of control? I, I noticed what you mentioned about, about anime and I noticed in the early uh, cell shaders that it's, it's just like, okay, let's just do an outline uh, and let's just make the light do highlights and very hard changes, but it doesn't look good at all because artists don't shade stuff thinking on reality, they think on readability. So, um, so, so are you doing something of that or how would you, you approach it uh, if you want to expose us to, to the artist? Like how, how is the process to give the artist control of that? So this is, actually, this is a very interesting question and I can only answer a part of it because that's actually one of the questions I had for my PhD and I haven't gone to, the, to solving it yet. And probably only will find a partial solution. But the idea here is that you need to, under, I would say that uh, you do have the, some of the technical parts that an artist can uh, sometimes have to work with it. They can understand some parts. And I, they can understand the, some of the technical things. For instance, here the line, uh, the line separation, I did it independently, but for instance, Square Enix did something similar for Tales of Wedding Rings VR, and that worked really well for their artists. But you need to have the tools that show them what happens so that they can understand like why does the line appear well you can see it in the buffer uh, they uh, you also need like to have so ui can work but they can work around wonky ui and wonky ux if you explain it to them like if, since you are in the same project uh Malt actually works pretty well here because it's just a python file you just set it up once and then it just works uh, so the artist can uh, work as they want. But the actual control, like how can you control a line, for instance, the line width, stuff like that, you can put a lot of sliders, but that might not work well with most artists. 
uh, but at the same time, it's also hard to say something else. Like what could you do? Can you select a line? That's also a lot more involved, you know. And then you have to do reverse control. So it's uh, it's very much an open question, especially for silhouettes where they actually change depending on the point of view. So yeah. So you have to keep your artists in mind and try to explain it to them also. So you have to find the balance. All right, peeps. Uh, there are two things. First of all, applause for the speaker. That was awesome.